friends. Welcome to the COVID calls. I am your host, Ryan Pyle, and this is my Instagram live. How's everyone out there doing today? Well, I guess it really depends on what part of the world you're calling in from or listening in from, because some parts of the world are doing better than others. And of course, I hope that, you know, you are all healthy and safe during these challenging times and that you're not taking too much risk with your personal health or anyone else's personal health. Today on the show, I've got Simon Parker. Simon is a travel journalist and television host and producer. And he's been on the show uh, three previous times. So today I think is his fourth appearance. And, you know, first time I just wanted to learn all about Simon. And then the second time I think we talked about the future of travel. And then the last time we just riffed for like an hour and it was great. And uh, I don't know how you guys feel about these, but I'm really loving them. And I don't mind catching up publicly with my friends. And Simon's a new friend and I haven't actually met him before. Um, we just kind of connected online during this lockdown and figured out we had a lot in common. So um, because of the lockdown, I'm really happy. Um, I've made so many new friends through that process and that's been something positive, uh, of course, um, in something terribly negative. But uh, Simon is in the group, so let's get in Simon and figure out how he is doing, what the U what being in the UK is like, and the, whether he has any plans. Hey, buddy, how you doing? Hey, man, yeah, all good, very well, thank you. Um, Excellent. Uh, yeah, I guess you're kind of coming to the end of these things now, are you? I, I am, and I wanted to have uh, I wanted to have all my friends on for one last. For one last go, your episode ninety. Wow. Okay. So, when are you hope are you doing one a day or trying to I've, fit in more than one a day? I got two a day. I had one this morning too. I got two a day for the next couple of days, and then the goal is uh, is to make my way to Europe next week. Yeah, I've been following that on social media. That's that's really exciting. Yeah. Uh, I, at this stage, though, I don't know where to go, um, so I'm still kind of going to pick the best place to, to, that, uh, to travel to where where um, where hopefully I can do a test before I leave Turkey or do a test on arrival and uh, and just try to stay safe for two weeks before I start my filming in Switzerland which is still on somehow I just oh. need to I just need to get there with my crew and then uh, and then there's a job waiting for us there so that's kind of where I'm at so you're going to make a program in the Alps yeah, I'm walking the, I'm going to spend a month walking the 390 kilometer Via Alpina, uh, which is a trail that goes all the way across Switzerland from the border of uh, Austria in the east, all the way to uh, Montreux on Lake Geneva in the west. Yeah, awesome. I love, it's an amazing part of, part of Europe. I, uh, one of the, about 10 years ago, I cycled from London to Rome, uh, oh, wow. which is about, I don't know, 1,500 miles or something. And uh, yeah. the real challenging part was uh, cycling across the Alps yeah. via Lake Geneva and Lausanne. And uh, it's, a, wow, it's an incredible trip. Getting over those mountains on a bicycle is tough. But uh, I've been across the Rockies as well. That was even tougher. Very nice. Very nice. So look, man, like, you know, you're in the UK. Um, there's been lots of changes in the UK over the last few days. Um, What's it? What's the news in the UK, and how are you feeling about it? Well, everything is opening up pretty rapidly, to be honest. Um, for some people, that isn't the greatest thing, but it seems like that's the way we're going, kicking and screaming. Um, the government has made quite a concerted effort that we need to um, stimulate the economy. We need to get back on our two feet. We need some sort of economic stimulus to kind of catapult us into the next year or so. Right. Some people are, are concerned about that. Um, I think personally, we can we can do that uh, safely by just keeping our distance from each other. Sure. Uh, the pubs are open, which was the, the biggest concern for um, for Brits who really do like drinking. Mm -hmm. um, so, but then again, you see some. You may have seen some pictures from London, for example. Um, you know, they the, the pubs opened at the weekend, and there were huge crowds of thousands and thousands of people which yeah. do concern some people however our infection rate still seems to be going down so i'm not sure what's going on it may be it may correlate with the fact that it's the middle of summer and 
the research suggests that COVID-19 doesn't like warmer temperatures, it doesn't like high UV. So maybe we're just getting lucky. But I think in general, our lockdown in the UK has been quite, uh, quite weak uh, in contrast to some, some countries which kind of stamped it out in one go. The Brits don't seem to have followed that so closely. We had about we had about two um, we had about two months of really quite significant lockdown, but then that has come out. But um, the the real significant thing for me is I absolutely love my cricket, and yeah. this this weekend the cricket season starts uh, three months after when it should be. So England are literally just starting to play their first test match right now on the television behind me. So okay. after this, I'll spend the next two or three days glued to that. Two or three days. Yeah, a cricket match, a, a test match goes on for five days. Oh Jesus! Yeah, um, I was I was speaking with Tom Tom Hudson um, two days ago, and we and, and he's also in the UK, and he was we were talking about the pubs, and he went to a pub uh, the other day and sat outside, and um, and he was kind of talking with the pub owner a little bit, and he's like, man, he's like, we're better off being closed because there's so few customers. Uh, he lives up in uh, near Manchester. He says there's so so few customers and he has to hire two extra staff just to do all the cleaning, yeah. um, you know, in and around the customers once they leave and stuff like that. And he just said, you know, the not being able to have everyone inside uh, plus the cleaning and everything. And then it's just, uh, he said it was, you know, difficult for everyone. You know, the problem is, is that everyone's now over the last couple, it's, it's, it's expensive to drink in pubs in the UK. I mean, for example, in London, you might be thinking about five, six pounds just for one pint of beer. And during lockdown, people have just realized that you can sit and drink in the park or sit in your garden and have drinks at home. And you can, can you, buy- Can you drink in the park in, in the UK? Yeah. yeah, that's, yeah that's yeah. illegal in the United States and Canada. Yeah, well, yeah. They, love, Pub- they, love, they, love rules in, um, they love rules in North America. They You're not allowed to drink in a pub, but you're allowed to carry around a gun. But, you know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah. So, for example, people have realized that uh, you don't have to go to a pub and spend five or six pounds. You can just sit in the you can for a fraction of the cost. You can sit in your own garden. And if the pub does, if the pub feels like your garden, then why on earth would you go anyway? So I think it's going to take a while for the pubs to really get back on their feet. Yeah. Um, the, the chancellor of the UK has just made an announcement in the last couple of hours. Uh, he, his phrase was. Uh, what was his phrase? Eat out to help out. So he's trying to, he's just slashed VAT so that people try and go out and eat out more just to try and stimulate the, um, the tourism industry and the, um, you know, the eating out industry. Wow. That's bold. I've, yeah. I've been, I've been ordering in. That's been like my big thing, but I still haven't gone to a restaurant and I definitely haven't gone to a bar. You haven't gone I've, to a pub? No, not at all. Or, or a restaurant. I just I just keep going to the grocery store and then uh, the big thing for me is like I love pizza so the big thing for me is this last like month or so I've been ordering pizza from a place around the corner mm. and the guy brings it and I eat it and that's it I mean I just have no interest in uh, mingling with other people I I don't know it's, I think it's going to take me a while well I think we're quite similar in that sense you know that's why we that's why we created careers which allow ourselves to go and spend many months at a time as far away from people in the mountains that's why we bonded in the first place but yeah. i know what you mean I, i'd rather if i'm going to go out and spend 50 dollars on a nice meal in a pub i want there to be some form of atmosphere there has to be a reason why i'm going there right. because i can just i love cooking at home i love eating outside in my own garden and stuff and yeah. you know why wouldn't why wouldn't i do that at home where there has to be some genuine reason why you would go to the pub there's someone here Walper style says in Korea, I bought a beer from a vending machine across the street from a school. The lack of government rules is awesome. Well, yes, that does. That does sound awesome. Did the vending machine have single malt whiskey? That is my question. That would be amazing to know. Um, so I, I, I feel pretty much the same about, about, about this the way you do. I mean, and I've seen, you know, you've been writing uh, stories. You did a story uh, for, I think, the Telegraph all about gardening and, and, where the vegetables in your garden are coming from and you're cooking at home. And I mean, it's great that you have that kind of space. Um, you know, for people who are maybe living in central London in a studio, 
you know, they need they need to get out and have a drink every now and then. I think. Oh yeah, certainly. I I live when I'm in the UK. I live in I have an apartment, but um, we have this brilliant thing in the UK called allotments, and uh, allotments were I think a post Second World War initiative in which we realised that we had to grow all of our own vegetables. So um, that's that tradition still exists here. So I have a small parcel of land. It's okay. probably about I don't know. Uh, 20 meters by 40 meters and it's packed full of potatoes and tomatoes courgettes cucumbers it's an, it's an amazing release really i love i never thought i'd be into that sort of thing but when i'm not traveling around the world i do like to grow my own vegetables which is strange it's a strange change of pace absolutely but, uh, it's therapeutic as we get older we need to find things that kind of stimulate us in, in a less deadly fashion i think I'm waiting. I'm waiting for my lawn bowling career to kick off next. That's my. That's, I'm waiting for that. That's gonna be my. <laughs> that's gonna be my huge move. I think. You know what? I just joined the tennis club in my oh, local yeah? in my local town, yeah. and the tennis club is also a lawn bowls club. Yeah. So I managed to uh, I managed to get a taster session at the bowls club uh, to give it a go, and I was absolutely useless. <laughs> it's nice. It's hard, good man. Fun. Yeah, yeah, they take that. They take that seriously. It's uh, it's pretty wild. It's pretty wild. So, so the UK is opening up, um, and it looks like Europe is opening up for Europeans. But still, traveling from outside is a little bit difficult. I know there's a there's a list there's a list of like eight pre-approved countries where you yeah. can now travel into Europe without doing a 14 day quarantine. Um, yeah. One is the UK. One is Canada. Uh, I think Serbia, Montenegro, um, Australia, New Zealand, um, and I think maybe that's it. Uruguay. I, I saw Uruguay on the list. Does that make sense? Um, Perhaps. I I, I'm, I'm looking at a list now. I think these are mostly Europe. Uh, because, what, for example, last, last week the British government released a list of around 60 countries. That you can go to. Well, yeah, but then when we actually started to investigate it, uh, mm -hmm. investigate it a bit as journalists, we realised that actually only 25 of them are actually accepting people in. So the UK government said, you can go here. But right. then countries like Australia and New Zealand said, hold on, our borders are closed until the end of the year. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So when you, when you actually drill down into these things, you realise it's a complete fudge. And it is. They're just making these things up as they go along. I'm so glad you guys are doing the research because it's all bullshit. Like, um, like you know, Dubai reopened for tourists, and I can go back to Dubai today if I want. But I have to film in Switzerland in August, and now it's like already July 8th or something like that. So if I go back to Dubai, I might not be able to go back to Switzerland. But if I go mm. from Turkey into Europe, then I can go to Switzerland. And yeah. I'm still the same person. So I don't know how any of this works. And then the big thing that pisses me off oh wait someone here said uh one drinko two really enjoyed earth cycle i hope you make some more oh man you got some fans in here oh that's cool that's that's nice that someone's saying that i really do I also hope that we do make some more <laughs> yeah um so so the the thing that bothers me is is that everyone is doing testing 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 and if you trust your tests why aren't you just testing people when they arrive and letting free movement again like like is the is the you know if you trust the testing and everyone's doing testing and every day there's news stories about how many people are this that and the other thing all because of testing then why wouldn't you just test people on arrival and 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 allow you know open up the borders again yeah but it's exactly what we were discussing a couple of weeks ago there is yeah. a total lack of cohesion and cooperation between all the countries yeah. looking at looking at these lists of countries every single one has its own slightly different rules yeah and i think it'll be like that for the next couple of years really yeah so i mean what on earth you know how on earth are we going to to go forward we're just gonna have to i think we discussed this as well we're just gonna have to find our own trusted pockets yeah. that we want to go to and that's how we're gonna to have to move the days of people like you and i being able to zigzag around the world going from 30 40 countries a year i'm not sure if we'll see those days for, for a very long time i think we're going to have to stay with trusted countries uh, and, and that's the way and we're just going to have to hope for people like you and i who want to make documentaries about interesting wild 
big places. We're going to have to hope that those places let us in, essentially, because I don't really want to be going to Paris. I don't really want to be going to New York or Madrid. I want to be going to out of Mongolia or the Australian outback. Yeah. But I was, I, I was invited onto a, a BBC uh, radio programme this morning, and I always get asked now, you know, where do you think you should go? What's the trend coming up? And I really do think that we are going to have to be reactive to the situation that we're in. And the situation we're in is that COVID-19 breeds in dense populations. It breeds in cities. It breeds in pubs. That's where it's going to be. So the big trend is going to be going further and further away from that. They're asking me, where should I go? And I, I love traveling through Scandinavia. Scandinavia is such a beautiful place, but it's so wild and sparsely populated. You can spend two or three weeks and not see another single single human being. Right. And for the next couple of years, that's the way it's going to be until we get a vaccine, until we, to, till we can get to a point where we're back together and we're not infecting each other. Yeah. then that's the sort of thing we're going to have to go for. Unfortunately, that isn't possible for everyone. Al Alana Roseland is saying, we loved Earth Cycle 2. When can we watch it on Discovery Channel? My God, man, you're oh, another one. Chicka Wade, Earth Cycle is awesome. Are you paying all these people to join in the conversation? <laughs> How many beers are you going to have to owe after this? I'll confess uh, that at least one of those three I do know. Okay, uh, that's good. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, uh, support starts at home. Mm. Support starts at home. Very good. Um, I, I have a question for you. You wrote a really nice article the other day, and I, I follow you on Twitter uh, more than I follow you on Instagram because you're a journalist and Twitter is the world of journalism um, in a lot of ways. Uh, but I follow you on Instagram. And you posted a, a link to a nice story you did about how how we've all been fooled into into thinking domestic travel or domestic air flights are okay. And And I was wondering if you could chat, walk me through a little bit more about this and your feelings about domestic air travel for our audience, because I actually, I think you're spot on with this because I, I you know, we've talked about this before, um, maybe online, maybe offline, I can't remember, but I lived in China for 16 years. And once those high speed trains came into play, I didn't fly for the last four years I was in China. I would just take high speed trains everywhere. Um, and it was a dream come true. And I, I just feel like uh, it's such a such an easier way to travel. And I actually just read that the GCC, the Gulf Committee of Countries, um, are are building high speed a high speed train network to to connect all the major cities in the Gulf. And I just feel like that's such a way forward. So where do you stand on all that? Yeah. So the the story you're referring to, I, a couple of weeks ago, I wrote a column for the Daily Telegraph in the UK, all about my opinions on domestic travel and how we can improve that moving forward. And I think one of my, my big passions is the fact that we shouldn't really be flying domestically, especially in a country as small as the UK. A couple of weeks ago, EasyJet released, or EasyJet um, returned to flying from, uh, from London to Glasgow. So it's a trip of about 400 miles. And my argument was that actually now that we've had this opportunity to recalibrate and come back to the table with fresh ideas, we should really be using this as an opportunity to have a nicer and better impact on the planet which we live in. And domestic air travel is just not one of those things. I think there could be an argument for it in somewhere like China or somewhere like the U US. Of course, flying from New York to Los Angeles is significantly cheaper and it's much easier. But in somewhere like Europe, we really should be championing uh, bicycle and, and train travel. That was the yeah. whole, main, one of the big ethoses of making Earth Cycle, this program, was trying to encourage people to get back on their bicycles and go on these big adventures because it is a, a green and eco-friendly way of traveling. And every bike ride you finish, you come off of it and you're slightly healthier. And you know we really shouldn't be um, flying two or three hundred miles at a time on a, on a plane. I, it annoys me that uh, uh, airlines like EasyJet and Ryanair, they're, they're self-serving interests. They're thinking, right, we need to get our business back up and rowing, running. They, they show off to the fact that they have 500 routes around uh, uh, Europe. That shouldn't be the case. We shouldn't be doing that. And it all boils down to the fact that governments have never invested enough money into rail infrastructure. There are some 
countries around Europe which have amazing high-speed rail. But then in the UK, for example, traveling by train is expensive, it's cumbersome, and it's just not what it should be. That's what we should be investing money into. There's a big engineering project going on in the UK right now called HS2. And it costs several, I think, 20 billion to try and create a new high-speed route from London to Manchester. And it's one of the most controversial engineering projects in the history of Great Britain because people are saying it's just totally unnecessary. Arguments are from people like me that we should be investing that 20 billion into existing rail networks so that we can all get around our country much quicker and and with ease. And I, I really think that that's what we should be doing. We shouldn't be flying around. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's interesting. And, you know, I mean, without, without the, uh, the environmental elements playing such a big role, just um, going through a train station and getting on a train is, is just so much of a nicer experience than going through an airport and getting on an airplane. Um, whether you're talking about security or just, you know, space and, and, and privacy and things like that. And then also, too, um, trains are almost always on time. And, you know, you and I have probably been stuck in some massive delays uh, at airports in the past. And, 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 and in China, sometimes they'll, they'll lock you on a plane and they'll sit you on the tarmac for hours on end. That was a huge issue um, mm. during my time there as well. Uh, Chicka Wade is saying, as an environmentalist, I completely agree with most of these points. Well, there you go. You got, you got, you got some backing there. I, I, I think, um, I think you know, rail networks are the best. I, I, I absolutely love traveling by train, and uh, it's just, it's just so much nicer. I just wish that they could figure out how to do it cheaply. Like, this is the issue. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I can't remember exactly when, but the. The, the railways in the UK were privatized 30 or 40 years ago. And that has, um, that has made uh, rail travel quite um, unachievable for most people. There is a big debate, especially within the Labour Party, that they nationalized uh, the rails, railways again, but that's pretty much impossible. But for a traveler, I travel constantly throughout the year. And sometimes some of these journeys I weigh up uh, the time spent getting to an airport, sitting in an airport, flying, and often it's much easier to um, to take a train. Right. Uh, one of the main embarrassments of what I've done over the years, last 10, 15 years, being a travel writer, is the amount of flights I've had to take around the world. Right. So these days, when I do uh, go off on an assignment and I do go to the other side of the world to tell a story, I really have to think to myself, is this an important story? Am I really getting something out of it? Am I justifying my worth of traveling to the other side of the world on a plane to do this? Maybe 10 years ago, I wasn't so aware of my personal impact on the environment as a journalist. But now I think we're becoming a lot more aware of that. I agree. I agree. Uh, Christoph here is saying we had a bicycle shortage in Australia during the pandemic as everyone didn't want to be stuck inside. Yeah, that makes good sense. That's a fantastic situation to be in. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, as long as you've got a bike and you can actually go out and use it. Cycling is a wonderful way to keep your social distance, right? And, and just not having to sit on public transport. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty worried about, you know, I'm gonna fly, I'm gonna fly next week. Like, and I'm, I'm pretty, you know, unsure what that's gonna look and feel like, because it's, just going to be a lot of plastic and probably some discomfort for for a few hours anyways of going to the airport like i i go to the grocery store now and when it, i i avoid peak time at the grocery store just because i don't i don't really like being shoulder to shoulder with people in the in the in the uh in the line to the, the checkout line it's um yeah i personally i've become a bit more cavalier about being around people i don't mind the prevalence of covid-19 has dropped so significantly in the uk that you'd have to be very, very unlucky to encounter someone for that length of time to be able to pick something like this up personally. The yeah. real problem is being infected asymptomatically. There might be yeah. so many people who have COVID-19 who never knew they knew they've had it. But I'm starting to think about where I want to go in the next two or three months. And I am looking at these assignments and I'm thinking, do I really want to spend 24 hours on a plane going on three or four airplanes transiting through four or five airports that just is a side of my job which i really haven't missed 
whatsoever. I love right. being on the other side of the planet. I love being in the mountains, in the middle of an ocean or wherever. But the traveling is always the worst thing about traveling. Uh, if, if only we could. And that's what scares most people off. And that's what most people don't see. People read our articles or watch our programs and they think, oh, that's an amazing job. But they forget about all of the rigmarole it's taken to get to that point. And that is the bit that I've really not missed whatsoever. And I feel more energized than I think I ever have in the last 10 years, because what we do for a living is extremely exhausting. It right. looks cool from a distance and it is an amazing way to live our lives. But all of the traveling, all of the spending time, all the queuing, the amount of time, the amount of time I spend in queues in airports is just crazy. A few years ago, I calculated that I spent something like three or four hundred hours just waiting in airports over the course of a normal year. That's right. time I'm never, ever going to get back. No, it's crazy, right? But that's 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 quote unquote living the dream, right? That, that's what it takes to put you in the spot to get the idea to write the words that come out. I mean, that's the that's where the magic is. But uh, hey, you can always come down to Europe and ride around Europe with us in a car because that's what or a van. That's what we're going to be doing for the foreseeable future. Yeah, man, we should definitely um, we should definitely link up in person. Uh, yeah. So you, you're always more than welcome to come and stay with me in North Oxfordshire. It's a beautiful part of the world, actually. There's some good, uh, good hiking trails around here, and we get you on a bike and you can go out for a ride. Um, I, I know, I know. You normally spend your winters in South Africa, and that's pretty much going to be difficult. So have you have you picked out a place in southern Spain or Portugal or some place you think you might want to uh, base yourself for the for for the winter? I mean, is that still an option? Yeah, so I've been in a very privileged position the last few years that now that I've got a series of people that I work for across the BBC, Telegraph, Independent, etc., I yeah. can now choose an interesting part of the world I want to go and escape winter. I really hate the cold. I'm not cut out for the, the British winter whatsoever. It's dark and it's wet and I'm, it's just not my sort of thing. Right. So uh, under normal circumstances, I either go to South America or Central America or last winter I spent that in, uh, in South Africa. But it's looking like the COVID peak is starting to really ramp up in South America. So what I'm now thinking is I'm probably going to go and spend uh, the winter in, in Spain. I speak pretty good Spanish and uh, the average temperature in southern Spain during winter is around 20 degrees. So it's significantly warmer than the, uh, the British summer we're having at the moment. And uh, I'll go down there. And the cool thing about being, especially in the Sierra Nevada region of southern Spain, is I can live near a ski resort uh, so I can go snowboarding in the afternoon and then in the evening go and have drinks on the Mediterranean in bright sunshine. I've, I've always, awesome. yes, Andalusia, uh, Costa del Sol is a, a really special part of the world. Um, it's relatively normal in terms of it. It's, it's exactly the same as the UK. I can get a good hospital. I can uh, get everything I need to, but the climate is just, just perfect. The climate, especially during the winter, is, is quite dreamy. Freddie, Freddie Wilkins is inviting you to the Alps. I know Fred. Fred's an old friend of mine, actually. Oh, is he? Uh, yeah, yeah. We have, uh, you and I have quite desirable lifestyles. Freddie is a, a very talented pianist and, oh, wow. um, and ski instructor. So Fred lives a really nice lifestyle. He spends his winters in the French Alps teaching people how to ski and playing uh, piano gigs in the evening. And then in the winter, in the summers, he gets on cruise ships and goes around the world uh, playing uh, uh, playing gigs on cruise ships. So he's got a really nice lifestyle. I, I don't know if that I don't know if that cruise ship money is going to come back too soon. No, I saw him a few weeks ago actually, and he was saying it's pretty much dead in the water for the next couple of years. Which yeah. is uh, we can bond over that because it feels like my industry is pretty similar for the time being. One thing, being, yeah. one thing I keep wondering about is, so when you leave Istanbul, what on earth is going to happen to your cat? Oh, he's coming with me. Yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah 100%. That cat's, that cat's part of my family now. Um, he, uh, he, so it, once you get, so what you do is you got to go through like the, all the vaccination stages and, and, and we've done that. And then, uh, and then once he gets his like last rabies vaccination you got to wait 30 days and then he can travel to the eu without a quarantine um and he can travel in the passenger compartment with us so so <laughs> that's uh that's uh, that's 
that's going to be amazing. Yeah. So, and then he's just going to become like our crew cat because we're going to be in cars and vans and hotels for the, for the upcoming uh, few months. And we'll just bring the cat with us. It's going to be a traveling cat. You could probably we'll, start paying the way. Probably if, if we had any money, <laughs> we got to get back to work before we can start hiring new people. But, uh, even a cat, but um, oh, that's really cool. Well, let me know how you get on with that because I might. I that would make quite a funny story, actually. Yeah, uh, the uh, yeah, the the kitten traveling around with the Discovery film crew. Quite yeah, like that. Exactly. Freddie's saying, "Ha ha ha!" The ships are definitely sinking. Yes, that's probably true. I went. I I I wouldn't go on a cruise ship not ever again. I don't think that's. Terrifying. I've done a. I've, I've, uh, about this time last year, I was invited onto a cruise to do some public speaking. I do quite a lot of uh, public speaking gigs. I go to members' clubs and university schools, cruise ships, and talk about what I've done around the world. Sure. I went on one last year. It was an amazing experience. It was a, it was quite a small cruise. I think there was only about three or four, or maybe yeah, about three hundred guests on board and about four hundred staff or something. But uh, yeah, I know what you mean. I probably wouldn't want to be on one of those packed cruise ships with lots and lots of people. I mean, no. it, it feels like a lifetime ago, but at the beginning of this whole crisis, remember what it was like for those thousands of people stuck on those cruise ships. I can't think of anything worse. They weren't even allowed to leave their uh, leave their rooms, their cabins. And right. I've spent I've spent time in the middle of the ocean in a tiny, tiny yacht. Uh, but at least I could go out on the deck and. Right. And see the stars and throw up. Imagine what it'd be like in in a cabin, locked in a cabin. Well, I I mean, I, this morning I spoke. I, I did a COVID call with um, someone who works at World Nomad, the uh, travel insurance company mm. based out of Sydney, and he said that he said that all the almost all the cases in Sydney can be traced back to one cruise ship that came in with 2,500 people who just got off the boat and walked into the city, and no one had tested them. And almost every case in Sydney can be traced back to that boat. And then now you've got Melbourne in lockdown again. Uh, we talked a little bit about that, but there was an interesting one actually. It, it talk, we talked all about the travel insurance business and how you know most travel insurance companies aren't issuing policies because they're trying to do the math over what the risk is in the future of people traveling. Because obviously, you know, if you go to southern Spain for two weeks. Um, during normal times, maybe, you know, you get hit by a car or you trip over your shoes or whatever, and that's probably the worst thing that'll happen to you. But now, you know, you could go to Southern Spain and end up in a hospital for three weeks on a ventilator. So the cost, the cost differential there is a lot different. And, and we were just chatting about, um, when, when the industry is going to start taking shape again, uh, and kind of stabilizing and normalizing for insurance. So do you, as a as a UK citizen and resident, as an English as a as a man from England, when you go down to Spain, does your insurance still cover you? Well, yeah. So things have changed significantly post Brexit. So oh, we always right. we, we always used to have uh, a European travel insurance card, which allowed us to get medical cover in the European Union. But that has changed somewhat in the last few months, and I think. By the end of this year, that won't exist for British citizens anymore. I take out an annual travel insurance policy because it just works out much, much cheaper. And I've, that's actually always really looked after me uh, overseas. I, I once uh, broke my leg in Peru and was oh. flown, flown home for surgery and looked after, and that was all covered on, on insurance. Wow. Equally, the, the, I have insurance through the people I work for. But somewhere like Spain, yeah, that that would be fine. I'd, I'd be covered by my insurance policy as long as I wasn't there for any more than three months at a time. Generally, yeah. I always go back to my home country within within three months, just so that I can uh, reconfigure my my policy. Basically, yeah. Well, I should come down and hang out with you in Spain then. That would be nice. Yeah, definitely, definitely. It's a really, really cool place. It, it, it's uh, during any normal summer, southern Spain is incredibly busy and the brits love it i think there's i think there's something like uh five million brits go there in every summer or something but uh, from around october it just it's a really fantastic place to live and it very rarely gets cold but it's a very very dry cold so i sure. often spend winter out there my um my auntie lives in malaga and we light the fire under blue skies and and warm sunshine it's an amazing place to be good wine good food 
And it, if you're into active things as well, so there's lots of surfing off the southern Atlantic coast, paragliding. I do a bit of paragliding and it's good for hiking and, and snowboarding. So, yeah, I think that's what this winter's going to be like. I'm trying to get a book commissioned at the moment. So I'm really hoping that if that if I do manage to get that commission, I can sit in a nice little house in southern Spain and get writing for the winter. Isn't that the dream? That's the Hemingway world, man. Yeah, I hope so. I really, really hope so. Um, I'm reading um, On the Road at the moment by Jack Kerouac. Okay. And uh, I, I wrote this, I, I was listening, I was um, reading this really interesting uh, thing about how he created that book. He wrote that book sat at his typewriter for three weeks straight. He didn't move and wrote the whole book. So I don't think uh, my writing style will be quite as frantic. Um, but um, I do like the idea of going overseas, doing some cool journeys, and then sitting in, in a nice little cottage in the mountains somewhere and writing it up. That is the dream. It's a little bit like that at the moment, but would be nice to have that book commission behind me. Absolutely. So, um, how's the, so you know, how's the, the TV industry warming up again at the moment is it still as is it still as dead in the water as it was a couple of months ago are you seeing any green shoots at the moment not from the television industry so like obviously there's big news like you know tom cruise can come into england without a 14-day quarantine and you know mission impossible will get back to filming and some of the film studios in hungary and romania are back up and running um but you know productions like mine that have just ridiculously small budgets um you know we're you know no one's really no one's really moving at all no one really knows when we'll be able to go back into production and 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 again when that when we'll be able to do that safely um mm. you know for big blockbuster movies you know they'll figure out the insurance because they because they're on a timeline and they don't want to lose the you know lose the stars or, or lose the window for um lose the window for their you know for their theater debut or for their streaming debut so it's it's pretty interesting i mean I, I mean not one broadcaster has reached out to me and been like either pushing me to go back to work or telling me to like just take the year off like there's there's just so little communication going on and i think it's just because there's so much uncertainty but actually like i would really appreciate some dialogue like my corporate partners um some of the tourism bureaus we work with you know I'm, I'm speaking with some luxury brands and, and uh, an alcohol brand about collaborating. And, you know, these people still have revenue coming in. They still have a marketing budget that they, I guess they have to spend. Um, and they still are looking for, you know, for people who have an interesting lifestyle or story to, to, you know, accompany that brand and, and, and share it. Um, but, but yeah, the broadcasters are in a tough, tough place. How is, how is it now with Earth Earth Cycle and getting it out into the world? I mean, I mean, sorry, doing doing season two and getting that kind of commissioned and getting people to actually give you a real answer. Yeah, well, it's reassuring to hear that you're in the same situation because I think we've discussed in the past that you are a few years ahead of where I want to be in in a few sure. years' time. So it's actually reassuring to know that you, who, who is significantly more established in that world, is having the same problems because. Yeah, we're struggling to get any any proper green light from anyone. The communication is just very, very weak. No one's ready to commit to anything. And I can't work out if this is because there are physically no people left in the office and they're just playing out whatever they have so that these networks can still operate to some degree. Right. And I, I, I can't work out. If it, the thing is, is like we were discussing this on WhatsApp the other day. The yeah. problem is, is that if they don't start commissioning really quite sharpish there's not going to be anything on tv next year right uh which would be crazy or they'll just be playing uh repeats and what will happen is um at the the, the way they make their money the ad revenue from the advertisements that will obviously have to go down because people don't want to have their ads associated with repeat content so and, it's, and it is frustrating because people like you and I, we create hopefully programs which to the network are not too expensive. They make us a nice living, but they're not crazy, crazy money. Uh, so hopefully it will be easy to green light. But getting anyone to commit to that at the moment is proving, 
proving hard. We are planning the future series. We've got three series set up and ready to go. We just need someone to say, yeah, go and make it. Right. We are, we're ready to do that. It's all, it's all being planned. The, 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 the series and the episodes have been outlined. We just need someone to say, yeah, go and do it. Problem is, we don't want to rush forward with that and take too much of a, a financial burden and investment ourselves and then find out in a few months' time that no one's going to potentially purchase it. So it is a, it's a chicken and egg situation. It's all about just making that move at the right time. And I will personally be following the lead of people like yourself to see, yeah. see what you're doing. But I think we're all in the same situation. Yeah, I mean, I've always been able to, I've always been able to do speaking engagements. Excuse me, I've always been able to do speaking engagements to bridge the gap in the funding so that I can control my schedule um, and let the people make the decisions when the people make the decisions. But, um, but now there's no speaking engagement, so I've really yep. lost that buffer. And, yep. and, and I, I think no one's really talking to people like you and I because no one wants to tell us to do anything because they don't want to be legally liable for anything. Like, I feel like this has not been figured out yet. Like if someone tells you to go back to work and then you get, you end up, you know, for two weeks or three weeks on a ventilator, like who pays for that or who's liable for that? And until there's like this question of liability taken away, I just feel like no one's going to really ask us to do anything. Um, and, and I'm worried that that, like, again, that was my call this morning with Phil uh, Sylvester. Like we were talking about just the insurance companies have to lead the way and create a new normal in travel so that we can all have the confidence to get on a plane or for me start filming again in exotic destinations with some level of confidence that if you know there we do contract something or injure ourselves that we'll be okay and um and it's strange that that's not there yet yeah i think if we if we had vast amounts of money sat in the bank then <laughs> Which would be lovely. We probably wouldn't which, be. We probably wouldn't be doing this. But we wouldn't be. If we'd we, be drinking together instead of talking yeah, about. Drinking. If we had, if we had enough money to to fund our series, now I don't think we'd have much problem in then selling it as an acquisition. But right. at the moment, both of us are probably in a situation that we want to get some form of pre-sale to validate right. making this next series. Uh, and yeah, no one's ready to commit to that yet. Yeah, which is. Frustrating, really frustrating. Because I'm, I'm just desperate to get back on the road. I, I, at times, I just feel so flat because I'm not used to living like this. I've spent the whole, la I've spent my whole adult life traveling frantically around the world and just living off this adrenaline drug. And now, yeah. all of a sudden, that's been taken away from me almost in an instant. And I, I find that quite deflating. Yeah. So just got to keep plugging away but the problem is everyone's in exactly the same situation and in the grand scheme of things how much of a priority is adventure television when there's all of these other big problems in the world so we've just got to hope that sooner rather than later we'll be able to create some escapist content really you see that yeah. so i really want earth cycle or to try and get this book commissioned so at least i can just feel creative on a daily basis i really miss getting up in the morning and feeling like I'm being creative and, and making something which people are going to be interested in. You want to know? You want to know my prediction is you're going to get both. You're going to get the book deal and you're going to get Earth Cycle, and it's going to come later than you want. But they're both going to get green lit because I tell you, there when all of this is kind of done or easing up, and people can start moving around again, people like you and I, there's going to be like 60% less of us. I hope so. I really, really, I really, really hope so. Because, because, yeah, I mean, people would have probably dropped off. They have, they've had to do goodness take, knows what. Take on other jobs or not worth the risk anymore or, or not, you know, not something that they, that they want to deal with. Man, people are loving you today. Holy cow. I got the people are, we need more adventure. You're still a priority, man. We love Earth Cycle. Yeah. Okay. Um, you got to, it's good. It's good work. You got friends <laughs> tuning in. Um, but no, I really believe that like a whole lot of people who do what you and I do have been so turned off by being a freelancer in this environment that uh, they're probably just going to 
try to find a, a, a more stable job so that they can draw on a, maybe a more normal wage and take some of the risk out of their lifestyle. Because, mm -hmm. you know, this has been devastating um, to, to freelance writers, photographers, and, and television and filmmakers. Like, people just haven't really, you know, come to terms with that yet. Because it, the entire industry is a gig industry. And if you don't gig, you don't earn. And it's, um, and it's really shocking. Yeah, and this industry was always competitive and unpredictable anyway. Right. But I actually really, I actually quite enjoyed that element of it, probably because I was doing quite well at it. <laughs> right. But now that, that level, that, now that playing field has just been leveled in Definitely. the space of a couple of weeks. It, it does feel a bit like being a 20-year-old again and starting again. Yeah. Because, you know, three months ago, I was sat in Cape Town getting a BBC exclusive with Roger Federer, and it was the highlight of my career. And then a week later, we started hearing about this thing called coronavirus. And then since then, it's just dropped off a precipice. Yeah. Like you say, the, hopefully the winners out of this will be the people who keep persevering and the people who just managed to tread water during this unprecedented time. I just hope that this goes on for a few more months and not a few more years. Yeah. Because when I really, it, I've started, I've stopped doing so much research into this whole thing. Because if you're not careful, you start thinking to yourself, you know, how are we going to get out of this? Without a vaccine, without vaccinating 7 billion people, we are in this problem. Well, for goodness knows how, how long. Yeah. We're going to be stuck in this state of paranoia in which none of us feel like we can. The thing is, we're not going to get these days back. It's not our lives. Are, our, um, our careers are on pause, yeah. but, our, but our lives aren't. I'm still getting a day older every single day. Yeah. And I might not live for I might only live for another 30 years, but I want to make sure that there are really, really cool, interesting 30 years. Yeah. And that's why I've decided to try and live like this. But it, it, it does frustrate me. It really does frustrate me. Yeah. I mean, I mean I'm, you know, I'm in the same boat. Like, you know, I've got more gray hair on my beard at the, now than I did when this all began. But um, it's, yeah, you, you don't know if you're going to live three more hours, three more days, or three more years. So you just want to try to, you know, live every day to your fullest. And, and right now, the most exciting thing I do is go to the grocery store. And that's not necessarily where I want to be but at the same time you know the responsibility of keeping other people safe the elderly safe people who are high risk you know keeping them safe and eventually this trust and this safety element has to be managed in a way where we can get back to doing something like living again um, and, it, and it looks like it looks like in the UK at least they're kind of jumping both feet back into getting getting back into regular life with the pubs and the restaurants and the outdoor way of, of living. But uh, I don't know. I'm not, not there yet. So how, so you've got your, you're going to film one program in Switzerland or you're going to double episode 390 kilometers and then, 30, 30 days. So you're in pre, you're kind of, you're in pre-production now you'll go on the shoot. How long are you, how long are you uh, planning for that? shoot to take you in total it's about 30 days okay and then how long will post-production take and then at what point are you going to start thinking about filming further episodes in different countries oh no we're gonna i'm gonna film for the next six months straight um and i have editors that are going to manage the post and i'll just be making notes every night and sending them with that and we're going to be getting like back into full full production and post-production uh in august so um, so right after Switzerland, we'll take a week off and then we go to Poland, we'll be in Poland for two weeks. And then after that, we'll take a week off, go to Estonia. We'll go to Estonia for two weeks. After that, we'll take a week off and the weeks will probably be spent driving between places as well. And then after that, I'm looking at going to Spain to see you. And then, uh, I found a trek in Mallorca that I would quite like to do. Mm. Um, and then after that, I need to get out of Europe because I'm only allowed to spend three months in Europe. And then I'm going to go into uh, Serbia, Croatia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, maybe Romania, maybe back into Turkey uh, and, uh, and do some more filming until I can go uh, safely back to the Middle East and film for the winter. Because I have some commission jobs there that were just waiting to be 
safe and and waiting for the good weather to come back. So I will, you know, I will be around. And and because of the way I fund my shows and the way I manage the pre-production, I basically do a lot of it myself. So um, so we can just keep on rolling um, once we once we hit the ground. We just all have to hit the ground at the same time, and then spend a few days trying to figure out what the new normal is with regards to keeping our distance, wearing masks, talking to people, being on public transport. Like, you know, we're filming in Switzerland. There's going to be a lot of gondolas. You know, we're going to have to wear masks on the gondolas. That's a confined space. Like, but I can tell you one thing, zero flying. Um, you know, I'm not eating in restaurants. I'll just eat at the hotel, um, you know, and we'll drive from episode to episode. And we'll just try to isolate ourselves as best as possible. Yeah. Um, so that we can keep working because if if we don't go to those countries and do those filming and and do those shoots, we don't generate any revenue. And then my guys, I feed about because of the shows we make, uh, you know, I I probably money goes through my company and into like seven or eight people's pockets. And right now we're all not earning. Um, the post production guys aren't earning. My production guys aren't earning. Like so, at some stage we need to be like, okay, going back into the world is scary. Um, but these are what the health professionals say we should do. Can we film somehow doing this? And we're just going to have to get used to it because I, like you, I've done some reading, like we're going to be with this for years. So like whether we start in January or start in August, we have to get used to some semblance of like new normal. Yeah. I th I've been thinking about exactly the same thing with Earth Cycle because although the finished product looks and feels wild and outdoorsy, there is a, uh, a suspension of disbelief to a certain extent because, it, yeah, it's me on a bike or it's you in the mountains, but there's actually other people behind the, the camera. Sure. Behind, that, the, behind that fourth wall, there are other people involved. And we as, I guess, the presenters, but also the exec producers behind these things need to think responsibly about how we're going to keep ourselves safe and how we're going to keep the crew safe. So yeah, I think having that own those those bubbles which we which we stay quite significantly within, that's going to be very, very important. But then equally, I'm not going to be wearing a, a face mask on screen or anything like that. There will have to be a way that we just take some very, very small risks. Because what we don't want is we don't want in this year period where we're producing content, in 10 years' time, we don't want it to look coronavirus -y. we want it to be timeless that the the, right. the the aim for people like you and i is to create timeless content we want yeah. it to be as appealing both artistically but also commercially in 10 years time as it is now so although the production arm will have to be tight it will have to be safe i think ultimately we're going to have to try and make the content look as fresh and as universal as it was before we'd even heard of coronavirus I agree. I agree. And Todd is asking us here, what contingencies do you guys have if there's a second wave? Well, look, if there's a second wave and Europe locks itself down again and I'm in Europe with my crew, I'm just, we'll, we'll obviously have to stop production. And I'm just going to try to get to Switzerland and rent a cabin in the mountains. And that'll probably be it for the year. Like, I mean, if, I think if there's a second wave and it's not managed, then I think that, I think that that'll be it for 2020. I think the, the worrying thing about second wave is, for example, if you've read about the Spanish flu, this, the second wave the, was the, worse. The second wave was was 10 times worse than the first wave. So right. if that happens, then we're in a real shit situation. Mm. I do think, however, that it'd be easier for us to deal with during the second wave because we have contingencies in place. We have um, processes in in, in place which will allow us to, to deal with it much better we have all the infrastructure in place we have all the we have all the kind of uh the opportunity to deal with it much easier um right. it won't be so much of a shock to the system because people will know what coronavirus is they'll know how to deal with it but it's scary especially for people like this it was really really scary i, I just don't We've over these four hours we've now spent talking about this. I still do not know what on earth the next year is going to look like. And no. under normal circumstances, I used to find that quite exciting. I used yeah. to be really excited about the fact that I didn't really know where I was going next month. But what I'm really 
excited about but what i'm not excited about now is the fact that i don't want to be in my flat in a month's time right i I don't mind being on the other side of the world doing something ridiculous, but I don't want to be stuck in my flat wondering where I could could have been. That is not the way I want to live my life. Um, just don't go to just don't go to July fourth, twenty twenty one, in Brazil with Bolsonaro. Did you uh, did you see that? Yeah, considering he's been so cavalier about um, he's been so he's been so cavalier about. Uh, coronavirus he's not been wearing yeah. masks he's been um <laughs> he's been shaking everyone's hands so he probably deserves it in, in some way shape or form it's a terrible thing to wish on to someone but someone who's been so brazen and so reckless uh, it's yeah it's a tough one it's a tough one I look, actually, the other day i watched ahead. your uh, brazil ride around brazil thing uh, oh did you on amazon live yeah it was really cool was that oh. one of the first shows you made yeah, yeah. That I did tough rides China, tough rides India, tough rides Brazil, and then I started the Extreme Trek series kind of after that. And uh, I'm going to get back into tough rides. Uh, well, I was supposed to do one this year. I was supposed to do two this year actually, uh, but they've been pushed till next year. So I'll be doing next year. I'll be doing, assuming we can all do things next year, I'll be doing Extreme Treks and tough rides intermittently and keeping those two series going because I love riding motorcycles and just hanging out with people. And the people I got to hang out with in Brazil were just so cool. Um, and whether, you know, it was riding that big ferry down the Amazon or getting yeah. stuck in the mud on the BR319, it's just uh, it's just such a good adventure every time we go out. Yeah, it's awesome. I was watching it. And uh, I think you, um, your, your, I think it might have been one of your support vehicles broke down and some guy came to help you. And then before you knew it, you'd been invited for, he was creating this huge meal for everyone. Yeah, roasting beef and stuff like that, and that is exactly the sort of situation that I've been in hundreds of times, yeah. especially on the side of the road with a flat tire. When I cycled across the U.S., all of the best experiences, all of the best adventures came out of adversity. When yeah. you had no idea what was going to happen, and you're on the side of the road, and you're thinking this could be the end of my trip. Someone just comes into your life, and for 24 hours, they become family that become your best friend and that that for me is the real spirit of of travel it's the spirit of adventure and and it it shows us how universal that human spirit is we all are very very similar if, if i was looking outside here and someone had a flat tire i'd go and help them i see if they want a cup of tea or have a beer and that watching that really really appealed to me I, yeah. it was it was a, a amazing adventure so i'd be eager to watch watch more of those in the next year or so Absolutely. And, you know, it's uh, it is amazing because the whole definition of adventure is something that you can't control. So by definition, every time you go out on an adventure, things are going to happen that you that you just can't control. And um, and it's just awesome to be out and, you know, taking chances and trying to find your way and getting lost and, you know, and, and being comfortable with those risks and being comfortable with the lack of control. And I think that's what makes you and I. Uh, similar in a lot of ways and also probably decent television hosts is that we're kind of just comfortable throwing it all to the wind and, and letting the chips fall where they may and just trying to be safe and getting on with it. Yeah, you have to be. You have to be. That That is the only way to do it. Or if you were really uptight in this industry, you wouldn't last very long. But that is the exhilarating, exciting thing about making programs or writing articles or radio documentaries or whatever. You have to just wing it. You just have to yeah. go with the flow, and that's an amazing way of living your life. Annoyingly, I've had to find some form of safety over the last few months, and I've had to hunker down in my apartment because that's the only way any of us have been able to live. But fingers crossed, we're just getting over it all now. We can start getting back to, to really living our lives, and in the, in the process, and on the flip side, sharing those adventures with all the people that are tuning in now or all the people who are interested in these adventures because a lot of the people around the world, they cannot go off and do these things themselves, but they enjoy vicariously living out these adventures with stupid individuals like you and I, who don't mind getting grubby or sleep deprived in the middle of nowhere. And that's a perfect point to finish off on. Buddy, it's been, it's been great. Thank you for joining me for so many of these COVID calls. Good luck on the book deal. Good luck on getting season two of Earth Cycle. And I very much appreciate your time and your point of view. And it's been fantastic.
no worries. It's been a pleasure. Stay in touch and we'll see you in Spain during the winter. Let's, let's count on that. Take care, everyone. Take it easy. Bye-bye. Okay, guys, that was my new friend, Simon Parker. He is awesome. And uh, yeah, COVID calls are carrying on. Two more tomorrow. Thanks, everyone.